Okay, cool. All right. So uh, I guess uh, originally I was supposed to do a, a keynote, and I thought to myself, I really don't have very much interesting to stay, say that's uh, publicly accessible. So I thought I'd drag Naval up here. Um, what I'd really like this session to be about is um, how to start companies more on the financial side, since I think you guys have gotten all the infrastructure and technical components through the rest of this conference. Um, we'll try and make that interactive. I'm going to ask him a few questions, and we're going to like banter back and forth a little bit. But for all of you guys out there that are running businesses on Twilio, if you're thinking about raising money, whether you do that from friends and family, whether you bootstrap it, whether you raise it from angels uh, or VCs, uh, I would strongly consider, uh, urge you to wait, consider. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on a second. What? Uh, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, the fire. Fireside chat. All right. Okay, now Dude. it's real. <laughs> Ooh, warm. <laughs> Actually, the lights up there are doing a good job All of right. <laughs> keeping we'll, us warm. We'll try and be a little less ghetto now. Oh, nice. Okay. That's oh, going. That's good. Uh, so I was trying to do the pimp out for AngelList there. How many people have heard of AngelList before? All right. Woo. Cool. How many of you actually raised money on AngelList? Yeah, I got a couple of folks. So uh, we are big fans of 500 startups. Many of our companies uh, we found on AngelList. Almost all of our companies uh, we've encouraged to list on AngelList. But whether or not you use that, Naval's uh, been pretty uh, vocal and has written uh, another site called Venture Hacks previously. So if you have questions about raising money, about like whether you should use lawyers, raise from dirty venture capitalists like me or not, um, now's a good time to ask those questions. Um, so what I, I kind of want to start off with uh, asking Naval is like, what do you think the current market is for raising capital? And do uh, you think it's a good time, bad time, or somewhere in between? Uh, historically, if you compare against the last 20 years, it's a great time to raise money. Uh, okay. there, you need a lot less capital. The number of people who can invest the amounts of capital you need is enormous. Uh, right. The speed at which they move is much faster than okay. it historically has been. The terms are very standardized, so you don't actually even need to read Venture Hacks that much because a lot of it has just become cookie cutter. Right. Uh, at the same time, though, as this supply of investment capital has gone up and the number of suppliers of capital have gone up, the demand for capital has gone up as well. Okay. There are a lot more startups uh, because of the rise of these platforms like Twilio. Uh, it's cheaper and easier than ever to start a company, so there are more and more companies clamoring for attention. So uh, it, it's not as bad as it used to be where there were 10 firms in Sand Hill Road, and if you couldn't get in front of one of them and get convinced them to part with 5 or $10 million, you couldn't build a company. It's very different today. Uh, I do think entrepreneurs tend to overlook uh, bootstrapping. Uh, right. Many of them try and raise too early and too much. Uh, but all the information is out there, the people are out there, and if you have a good company and good people and you've got some good evidence of uh, customer demand, uh, the, the world is your oyster. It's a better time to be an entrepreneur than to be an investor in that regard. So why, why should I or why shouldn't I try and raise money from professional investors? Like, what's kind of the framework to think about? Because I could, I could like bootstrap out of my own savings. I could borrow from friends and family. I can even right. do Kickstarter these days, maybe yep. if I, if I want to do that. And, and, and you're going to have to do all of those. Uh, okay. Even if you want to raise money from venture capitalists, there is a hierarchy before you get there. You will probably have to bootstrap first and then do friends and family and then do your Kickstarter and then your incubator and then angels or angel list and then your VCs. But it's a very quick process, and you can skip one or two of those stages, of course, depending on your traction. Uh, but I think a lot of companies would be better off being served as cash businesses or bootstrap companies. The reason is that the venture capital market really looks for IPO-style exits. Uh, right. They are looking for billion, multi-billion dollar companies that will go public within 10 years of founding. Okay. And the rest of the market below them, for a large part, and I know 500 Startups is an exception, uh, works backwards. And they say, okay, well, if I write a check, will there be a VC in the next round who will write a check? So you'll find even a lot of angels tend to look for so-called very big ideas. 
The problem with these very big ideas, of course, is they're all or nothing for the most part. You either yeah. end up as a Twilio and you're on your way to an IPO, or you go to zero. And there are lots and lots of great companies and businesses that can be built that are in between. In right. fact, the majority of businesses in the world were built without the benefit of outside ca equity capital uh, and will continue to be built that way. So sometimes you can take what might be a promising lifestyle or cash business for you and you can completely wreck it by bringing in outside money with uh, elevated expectations. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably for a lot of folks that can build on Twilio, I, I might say you don't ever have to raise from venture capital and you may never need to raise from any angels or friends, but certainly if you know, you're creating a business that might be you know, generating revenue or generating enough to pay your own you know, lifestyle within six to 12 months, that's probably not a business you need to raise money on. Um, that's right, unless, uh, uh, unless it is a winner-take-all business okay. and there's a foot race with a lot of potential competitors and there's at least a shot here that's gonna be a billion dollar company and it's something that you're gonna devote the next decade of your life to. Uh, then you should then you, you should consider raising venture capital. In fact, you will probably have okay. to. Uh, otherwise, you probably don't want to. So let's suppose I'm a one or two person company. I've bootstrapped a product to some level of functionality. Maybe I've got customers. Maybe I don't. But at least I'm to the point where something's working. Something's you know visibly functional. Maybe it's something I can charge money for. Is that a point where I should be trying to raise money or not? Generally, if you have uh, traction. Okay. which I would define as quantitative evidence of customer demand. Okay. Uh, and you, you think you can grow that, uh, that's a good time to raise capital. So is, let's say, let's like try and put some definition around traction. Is yeah. traction like I've got 1,000 users or I've got $100,000 a year or what's kind of the general Yeah, framework you know, people there? always ask how much traction is enough. <laughs> and it's so contextual okay. that the only answer I can give is like the uh, Supreme Court's definition of porn. Uh, you'll know it when you see it, <laughs> right? Uh, when you have traction, it's kind of obvious that you have some traction. Now, of okay. course, if you have total breakout traction, then the world is your oyster. Okay. But usually investors, uh, the investment market is very dynamic and fluid and, and actually relatively efficient these days. So any investor who's in the market uh, a, on a regular basis, such as yourself, will be very good at sniffing out what the current bar for traction is. Yeah. So for example, two years ago in a mobile app, traction might have been 10,000 users and growing 10% a week. Uh, a year ago, traction was probably a few hundred thousand downloads. Today, real traction in a mobile app, th the kind that gets VCs excited, would be like a million downloads right. for a purely online service. Obviously, okay. for an offline service like an Uber or something that has a real world component, the numbers are different. Okay. That's why I say it's so contextual. So maybe let's constrain this discussion then to business community, because I think you know, a lot of folks that might be building on Twilio are looking at you know, building business services to companies that might pay real money is, say, 100 customers that you're charging maybe $100 a month. Is that an interesting enough number to attract That's very attention? reasonable. Uh, in fact, you could probably do fine with even less uh, as long as you can, you, you can show the microeconomics of the business. Right. So you can say, OK, I know how much it costs me to acquire these customers. I have some rough sense of how long or how they last or how valuable they are. Right. And they are generally representative of the larger market. OK. Yeah, because I think you know, when I think about companies where I would you know, give them advice to say, okay, maybe you want to raise money, maybe you don't. If, I think if you, if you only need, say, twenty-five dollars to $50,000 to get the business off the ground and get to break even or get to some cash generated, I think that's you know, probably you can find that from either your own savings or from friends and family. You might not need to go yep. you know, to a professional investor. As soon as you start saying, okay, well, I need probably more like fifty dollars to $250,000, then I think you may be outside the range of your own personal savings or friends and family. And That's right. To and, and to some extent, you know, this environment is such that if you have a good product uh, and you have a little bit of customer demand, uh, you should be able to convince outside investors. And if okay. you can't, it's probably a bad idea to plow your entire life savings and your family savings into right. it. Uh, because then you're going to lose your company, your savings, and your friends and family all at the same time. <laughs> so all your eggs are in that basket. Yeah, as, as uh, someone who's previously uh, put about $110,000 in my own personal credit card debt, I probably wouldn't choose to go right. that route again for my uh, for next Most business. of the risk for good entrepreneurs these days is not so much financial risk. It's right. uh, opportunity cost risk because you could raise money. Actually, the worst outcome for you is not your business fails. You start a business that fails within a year. I mean, I've probably, I've started seven companies officially, unofficially probably 30. Yeah. There are probably two that I'll confess to. If that gives <laughs> an idea of the hit rate. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of failed attempts. It's just that when you raise money, you lock yourself into that failed right. attempt. You construct a prison for yourself from the yeah. promises you've made to your investors and employees. Well, you have to be very careful on that. I think also, you know, sometimes failing slow is also uh, one of the more 
damaging things. I think, you know, right. if, you're, if you're trying out a business and you fail quickly, it's maybe not the end of the world. If you spend three to five years on it, that might be a little bit more tough. Yeah. So, so let's frame it as, let's say, you know, maybe $10,000 to $25,000 is your own bootstrap or maybe yep. some friends and family. And you might do that on sweat equity. You might right. not pay yourself the equivalent of the ten to $25,000. You got to be careful in that one. There, there are a lot of people who come out of consulting jobs. They were making a lot of money, and then they value their sweat equity a little too highly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> keep in mind the opportunity, that sort of the competitive environment such that you have you know, groups of uh, people living on not quite ramen, but maybe pizza at 500 right. startups who are cranking away at night and they don't value their time I at think the we, same time. Uh, we define ramen profitability as uh, 3K per person per month, and I, yeah. I think that's probably about as low that's as right. you so can. That's right. So I'd use that kind of opportunity cost, yeah. not your maximum consulting yeah. rate or partner yeah, law I think, firm. You know, cost. we kind of think about, you know, initially bootstrap is maybe two to 10 person months. Yeah. And if you're valuing that at maybe $3,000 each, I think, you know, the high end of that is probably, you know, around 25 k where I would say, yeah, you, you might bootstrap yourself on 25 k or maybe you borrow a little bit of money from friends and family. But beyond 25 k I think you should start to think about whether it's a real business, whether you borrow money or not. At least for me, from, uh, historically, from the point in time when I said I'm going to start a new company, and uh, I was focused on trying to start a new company and hunting for co-founders and concepts and trialing things and so on to the point where the new company was actually real yep. and it was something I was committed to and, and I felt like I was going to go for it, it was about a year. Okay. And I've never managed to shorten that time frame, really? no matter how intensely I work. Okay. There, it, it, to me, it's, it's like having a baby. You know, there's only so much you can accelerate it because it just has to gestate. Okay. Well, I mean, I know we've funded companies that have been only around for maybe a couple of months. I don't know if we've gotten much less than that, but definitely within the three to six months. I would think the, the founders have been thinking about that problem or, th or working together longer. for a little bit longer, yeah. Although everything's getting faster these days, so it's hard to say. Okay, so let's now say that I, I am committed to raising some money from outside investors. Maybe I need at least twenty-five to 100000 yep. possibly up to 250000 now, how do I make a decision between should I raise from angel investors? Should I raise, go to an incubator? Should I take money from a larger VC? What's my framework for maybe those set of in investors to choose from? Yeah, it depends on uh, what stage you're at in terms of the traction. So it's not even really about how much money you need necessarily. Okay. Um, if you need help with certain things, like if you need help with metrics or uh, or marketing, then you know you should talk to 500 startups. If you need help with uh, uh, technology and maybe finding a co-founder, you know Y Combinator is a very good reputation right. there. Um, if you feel like you're ready for 100, 250 thousand dollars or more, um, and you have the traction for it, then you can probably skip that stage or right. uh, go straight to the seed funds or the super angels or the individual angels, and you can use AngelList. You can use your offline networks. You should probably do all of the above at once. Um, and then finally, if you need a million dollars and you have real breakout traction, uh, then you have to go to the VC route. But okay. these days, there are very few VCs who are writing Series A checks relative to the number of angels. Okay. Uh, and so the traction bar is very high on the venture side. And, and what's the amount of uh, equity that I'm going to give up in either the, in any of those situations? Incubators, seed yep. funds, uh, VC? Incubators generally are kind of the 4 to 7 percent range. Uh, okay. There are a few that are as high as like 30, but I don't recommend those. those are, you okay. have to do your homework a little bit. Uh, and at, at the incubator stage, it's not a price issue. You're not going to flip from one incubator to the other based on the exact percentage. It's right. going to be much more about uh, what can they help you with, uh, how relevant are they for what you need, uh, and uh, what kind of success do they have at their demo day. Okay. Um, with Actually, that, that's an important point. So in your mind, one of the most important things to evaluate is how well those incubators are at demo day and how well they are at helping the companies raise their seed round or raising, uh, you know, that's right. If you, if you give a 5% to an incubator and then the next round is an angel round where you sell 20% of the company, uh, that incubator has to bump your valuation by a fair amount, about a third to a, uh, or more, uh, okay. to compensate for the dilution that you took. Right. Uh, now, of course, you also get other benefits of the incubator, like the alumni network and the mentoring and so on, but that's just so you can do the math and the dilution and realize okay. that it has to bump your valuation to be worthwhile. And so if I feel like my product already has significant traction or I already know exactly sort of where I'm going on my customer yeah. sort of base, do I skip the accelerator and go straight to seed in VC? 
Generally, yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, seed, at that point, the super angels, uh, which are just basically VCs with better branding or smaller funds, depending on how <laughs> you want to call it, uh, those are the ones who will write the checks in the 250K to a million range. Okay. And those are uh, pretty well known. It's the uh, floodgates and felices and soft techs of the world. Right. Uh, and there's a few dozen of those. And then there's the VCs who will kind of start at the $100 million fund range, the true ventures of the world, the first round capitals, and then work their way up into the classic Sequoia, Greylock, Menlo, et cetera. Okay. And now why would I go to a seed fund or super angel versus going to a larger, more traditional venture capital fund? Traditional funds uh, are slower to move and make decisions. They have larger partnerships, more money under management. Uh, they have more checks and balances in place in terms of decision making. They're less comfortable at, at early stages. Uh, so they may want to see evidence of more traction than you have right now. Okay. Uh, and it's a much longer process. Okay. And is there any larger amounts of equity or more control and board yeah. seeds? Generally, the, the seed funds and the angels, you'll sell around 20%. That's kind of the average. Okay. Um, and in the Series A, which is what they call the VC terminology, uh, you could sell a third of the company. And then also because of the way they allocate the option pool, uh, but they take it out of your hide before their money comes in, right. uh, you could actually end up selling close to half the company okay. or more. Actually, I, I think that's an important point. I don't know we'll have time to go over that, but I would advise folks, if you're interested in this process, like yeah, the okay. size of the option pool is probably more important than the valuation, or at least yeah, as uh, you important? Know, the, the two most important things that tell entrepreneurs to keep an eye on in the term sheets is number one is board control. If you don't have board control, it's not your company anymore. Right. <laughs> You're an employee. So it's very important to keep that, especially at the early stages. And then the option pool has to be factored into the valuation. So the, the sophisticated uh, fundraiser or investor will not look at the pre-money valuation. They will look at the share price. I the see. share price captures everything. Okay. Uh, we have an article about this on Venture Hacks, a couple of years old, but it's still completely correct. It's called the option pool shuffle, and right. it's one of our most popular articles ever. OK, great. Um, so now, let's say that I'm in the stage of either raising Accelerator or raising a seed fund. Uh, why should I use AngelList? Uh, well, <laughs> if you yeah, that's a fair question. Um, when you go out to sell your Microsoft shares, right, that you're holding, you could sell them to your neighbor. Okay. Um, or you could go to the stock market. <laughs> okay. So I'm hoping that over time, AngelList becomes sort of that efficient place where you can easily go and find, create a market for your shares. Um, Today, we have 5,000 investors on AngelList who are uh, vetted and sophisticated. Uh, about 2,000 of them are partners or associated venture firms. Okay. Um, they're sliced so it's, and diced. So it's not just angels on Correct. AngelList, it's yes. venture capitalists too. Yeah, I'd say roughly half the dollar volume on AngelList that's moved is moved by professional venture investors. Um, we have them sliced and diced by location, market, propensity to invest, who they know. 85% uh, of our investors check in every 30 days on the site. Right. Uh, we curate and feature the top companies by email, uh, usually three of them a week. Uh, and we probably help at least one company a day raise mo some amount of money off of AngelList. Right. Um, and, and you mentioned this before, but I don't think that everybody yeah. maybe has noticed it. But you guys offer uh, standard uh, legal docs for free. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, so one of the things that we didn't like about the venture financing process, you know, originally the first thing we didn't like was that it was too hard to identify and meet good investors. So the core of Angelus helped solve that problem. But then Venture Hacks, we used to educate people on how to negotiate a term sheet. Right. And so now we're, we decided, screw it, we'll just do it for you. And the way to do it is we put up a set of very standard uh, entrepreneur-friendly uh, documents based on the Series C documents that Fenwick and West put together. Uh, and then we've got an equivalent convertible note. And instead of the usual 30 days and $20,000, we do it for free within four days. Okay. And it's all online workflow. It's beautiful and electronic. The term sheet is visual. You do e-signatures, ends up in your Dropbox, and it's all simple cool. and nice and easy. And it's designed to reduce a lot of friction in the system. And right now, we have uh, about five dozen companies going right. through it. And I think one of our companies recently, uh, Cucumber Town, also That's right. used it. They were actually the first guinea pig to, cool. to close on it. Very good. Yeah. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions in just a second. So if you guys want to think of some questions. and. Uh, I don't know if there's mics in the audience, but if you want to raise your hands, we'll pick on you. Um, you brought this up. I just want to ask this one in advance of the audience. Uh, why, what's a convertible note, and why would I use it instead of uh, some other normal price? Right. So document? convertible notes is basically debt. You, <coughs> you take debt from an investor, and you say you'll get stock in the company later in okay. the next round. 
and uh, equity is where they just say, no, 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 I want equity right now, so you give them shares right now. Right. Investors usually prefer equity because it uh, falls under the capital gains rules for taxes, so it's more tax efficient for them. Uh, and there are also legal strictures on investors which prevent them from doing too many debt instruments without being a licensed lender. Uh, entrepreneurs have traditionally preferred convertible notes because they're quick and fast, lower legal fees, less to negotiate, and you can close uh, different investors at separate times. You don't have to right. get everyone's money at once. Uh, those gaps between the two are largely disappearing. Uh, okay. One of the things that we do with Angelus Docs is we offer equity closing for free and quickly, so the speed and cost benefits of notes go away. Uh, we are also going to allow rolling closes and variable prices in our equity over time. Okay. So those other benefits of notes will disappear as well. In an ideal world, everybody would just do equity, uh, but notes have been a great hack in the meantime yeah. while the, the workflow software and the legal system and the whole marketplace catches up. Yeah. It seems like, you know, in my experience, the reason notes have been used is primarily because companies can start accepting money from investors immediately and not have to wait for everyone to agree, agree on valuation and terms. Yeah. Uh, and that sounds like a minor point, but I think when you're, a, when you're a startup trying to raise capital, you know, you may not realize it could take you three, six months or even longer to get a priced round together. Right. And those three to six months might mean, you know, anywhere from 50 to 100,000 or more in working capital. Whereas if you can raise on a convertible note, even though the terms might not be ideal or perfect in all structures, the ability to have working capital in the door immediately versus three to six months later is actually right. uh, so quite you can, substantial. You can use either one on, uh, on AngelList. You can go to angel.co slash docs and you have both available to you. Cool. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, go one over there and then... If you have questions, please come to the mics. Please come to the mics if you have questions. Okay, great. Hey, how's it going, guys? Um, so, so how far away do you guys think we are from a, you know, NASDAQ for early stage startups? And, you know, will that be AngelList? And how will, how will that uh, affect the ecosystem? Jesus, what a softball question. Yeah. Uh, uh, Naval certainly thinks that yeah. he is NASDAQ, and the answer is today. No, so <laughs> we're actually really far from that. Uh, there are a lot of regulatory barriers that prevent uh, the equity for private stage companies to trade freely. Um, there's also information barriers. There's so little information about any given company, and there's no incentive for a research analyst to cover it. Uh, so I think the reality is we're quite far away. I think the first thing we're going to see is when the crowdfunding rules are passed by the SEC uh, sometime uh, late next year, uh, and we have crowdfunding platforms, you'll begin to see inklings of that, but I think we're actually, unfortunately, a long ways from it. Actually, I should clarify, the difference probably there is whether you can raise money versus uh, use it for secondary sale Yeah, purposes. secondary, and then also when you can do the entire transaction online yeah, and do okay. it in some kind of liquid way. The reality is, even on AngelList, uh, where we can get you in front of a lot of investors, you're probably never going to be, have so much liquidity that you can truly let your uh, price float through a bid and ask type mechanism. Yeah. And e even on NASDAQ, be careful, because even on NASDAQ, even though it looks like a highly liquid market where there's lots of trading going on, when a company goes through an IPO, which is the equivalent of startups fundraising, uh, it's a highly manual process where the bankers build the book manually and call up a whole bunch of investors yeah. and go to a roadshow. It doesn't look that different from our process today. Yeah, and, and maybe, you know, on the inside, I think, you know, the process that's often followed on AngelList is to list privately on AngelList, raise right. money from people that you've actually know personally or have commitments, and then right. maybe list publicly once you've got yeah, some Yeah, a lot. The, we have very sophisticated access control uh, tools, so you can actually restrict it within your network, mm -hmm. raise from friends, family, uh, angels you know, and then open it up more broadly. Right. So I'd say, you know, if you're, raise, if you're thinking about raising money as a private company, the answer is probably close to now. Talking about selling or trading that interest, right. that may still be a little further out. Yeah, and we're not a registered broker dealer, so we don't handle money. Uh, there are people who do and who are not registered broker dealers, and you want to stay far away from that. Uh, and registered BDs like Second Market and Micro Ventures and Circle Up can handle money for you. Uh, the problem is that the moment you're a registered broker dealer, the compliance requirements are so high that the costs get very high in the whole financing. Right. Cool. Uh, I guess we'll alternate mics. Uh, next question over there. Um, hey, um, I'm in California, but not here in the Bay Area. Okay. So my experience with AngelList has been, if you don't already have connections, it's really hard to get in front yeah. of people. So I was wondering what advice you have for making like the first connections, if you know, for all those people here that aren't 
yeah, from the uh, Bay Area and haven't. So dealt companies with get before. companies get surfaced on a bunch of things. Uh, one can be on connections, another can be on traction, a third can be on uh, on uh, you know even the quality of the product. So the way we run is we got a hundred companies inbound a day. It's a flood. Um, we score them based on the founders' profiles, the traction of the company, who they're connected to. So all of those go in. And we try and look at anything that has anything interesting attached to it. So I would say um, fill out the profile as much as possible. Keep it up to date. You can always email me. My email is obvious and easy to guess. Um, and we will take a look at it. It's just keep in mind that Bay Area investors are very often will not invest in companies that are uh, more than a short drive out of the Bay Area yeah. because they have a hard time diligencing it. The network is not just there because of some old boys club where they're trying to keep you out. The network is there because that's how they diligence you and that's how they make sure that you are in a community of entrepreneurs who can support you when something goes wrong or goes sideways. Um, so if you are in California and you're not in the Bay Area or in LA, I would seriously consider moving to one of those places if you're really serious about your company. And you know, one of the things we were just talking about is you can list privately on AngelList and still solicit from selected folks. But I would, I would generally advise, you know, in terms of fundraising, if you have at least 50, uh, 25 or 50K from anyone, and ideally, you know, up to 100 or 250K from notable investors, that's kind of the range that you'd like to have before you start publishing broadly. Um, just like uh, when you're selling a house, if you put the house on the market and you get no uh, buyers or no takers, um, things will start to look kind of desperate uh, after a while. So you want to kind of get the listing at least to a stage where you've got modest amounts of either investor traction or product traction. Yeah, th that um, said, we actually have lots of companies that have put up now when they're just concept stage. We just don't feature them or push them to the right. ready. So they're not really going to get exposure. So you can, you can uh, leave it up and build it for a while. We also just recently did something with Dave where uh, 500 startups took applications directly to their accelerator through AngelList. Right. Um, and I think we sent you like a lot of applications and, and helped you sort through those. Um, we'll be doing that with a lot more incubators over time. So, you know, uh, basically a couple of months from now, you'll be able to one-click publish your AngelList profile into a whole bunch of accelerators and yeah. sort of spread the word that way. And then you'll have entire teams of accelerators that are looking at it. Um, you know, one other thing people don't realize is there's a lot of associates at VC firms that have access to our full admin queues they go through almost every startup. So you have been seen by someone. It's not like you're totally invisible. Uh, it's just that there's not a hook on there that's grabbing them. And, and especially if you're outside of a major funding hub, there has to be something exceptional. Uh, it's not enough just to have an aspirational product description, which a lot of people do. You know, a lot of, a lot of times people at the conference like this would say to me, well, I listed an angel list, nobody paid attention. I'll say, okay, send me the link. They send me the link, I go and look, and there's just so little there. Yeah, it's, it's usually... You know, I mean, one of the things we do with a lot of the companies that come through our accelerator program is help them like focus on their AngelList uh, profile. So I would say product traction measured either to in users or revenue, uh, investor traction where it's either dollars or a notable investor. Uh, failing those to some kind of advisor or other person on the team that at least has you know, company reference or college yeah. reference that's sort of notable. Yeah, we also look at, you know, where did the founders go to school? Did you get good grades? What companies did you work at, right? So we actually track all that data uh, as structured as possible. So for example, uh, if you go on AngelList, you can search by show me all the companies with founders that went to MIT or Caltech if you want people with technical bent, for example. So uh, all of the data is there, you just have to fill it in. It's like, it's like when you're trying to get funded, uh, think about it as you're basically asking people for a million dollars. That's going to be a very considered decision. And there are lots and lots of people asking them for a million dollars. So you do have to put a lot of information out there. Frankly, Angelus wouldn't have worked five years ago because back then you had to go raise money, then go build a product. Now you can build a product and then go raise money. And so because of that, the secrecy issues have gone down. And so it is possible to fundraise because people don't mind being public about it. Their product's already out there. So there's not as much to hide. Thank you. Cool. Hi, uh, David. By the way, you can always drop me an email. You guys should be arbitraging the lines on the left and right, yeah. by the way. Um, th this is fantastic <laughs> information, by the way. Um, I, I, I have a question. There, there's another aspect of secrecy that I, I wanted to ask you guys about, which is um, moonlighting. And um, many people want to work on new projects, but they don't want to leave their jobs. And, and, it, and it's an extremely uh, tough recruiting environment to find co-founders and... and and, and you've got some companies that have 
offshore accounts and how many people does this company really have or that company. I was wondering if you can talk about what what structures work and don't work and what and what are the what are the rules of the road. Yeah, so I'm sorry to tell you the bad news, but you can't moonlight and start a company at the same time. Uh, you, you can most, moonlight and start a prototype. You could. You can hack out a little prototype at your day job, but don't approach any investors. Uh, an investor will basically say, wait, you're not willing, you don't believe in this strongly enough that you're willing to jump from your current job, so why should I put my money behind it? Uh, nine out of ten investors will pass just on that basis. They might be too polite to say so, but that's the reality of the market. If you're, if you're applying for an accelerator, it might be okay, but if you're applying for real money from an investor, they're going to want to see that you've already quit your job. Accelerator is a kind of a good house, a halfway house between school or another job and getting out into the entrepreneurial scene. Yep. Uh, but especially if you're going to professional angels or, e or VCs, forget it, no chance. Yeah. Um, I mean, you just have to jump. The you question is, if, you, if you're not committed, why should I be? Yeah. And what about what about for uh, opportunistically picking and choosing different co-founders with th with yeah, different sure skill at the, the co-founder stage you you don't have to quit your job I mean you should be brainstorming with your friends and co uh, but having a co-founder is like getting married you'd better date for a while first so yeah, you should yeah. know them well and uh, that takes time speaking of that I would say uh, highly recommend founder dating actually uh, you know. No, no secret, actually, I'm friends with the founder. We're likely to invest, but uh, I think it's a great site to check out other founders. I would also you know, be using other social networks and like other services, so check out their profiles on GitHub, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, if you're already friends with them. Yeah, yeah. even on AngelList, there are tons of single founder companies, yeah. and uh, you'll see, I mean, it's a little hidden, but if you go to angel.co slash needs, you'll see a list of companies that are looking for other things than fundraising and talent, which is kind of all we do today. And one of those co-founders, you can just browse right through them and see who's looking right. and, and who they are. Cool. And, and I would you know, highly recommend, depends on whether you're consumer or business focused, but uh, I would be looking for someone on the team that's engineering, maybe more than one, uh, someone that's probably design user experience focused, someone that's customer acquisition, marketing, or sales focused. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Awesome. Um, so I've been hearing a lot lately, um, ba basically, uh, uh, if you have a good network already and are trying to get into a bunch of incubators, the, the A levels at least, uh, there's, there's actually an emerging concern of um, if you're not the darling, do you really get the same real value uh, out of it, uh, per se, like the top 10% of the incubator class or, or that sort of deal? You just don't get anywhere near the same attention yeah from what the, the talk. Uh, Sorry, you're, say, you're saying if I get into an accelerator? Yeah, I'm not, get not, into an accelerator and yeah. you're not in the... Top 10%? Or yeah. the darling. Like, yeah, that's kind of a high class problem to have. I think your yeah. question is whether you get in or not, but if you get in... I, I think you can draw some analogies to schools. Like if you get into Harvard, even if like you don't have the best professors and the best classes that you're taking, uh, but to some extent, it's your fault, right? Once you're into Harvard, you should make sure you get in front of the best professors. Yeah. Uh, but once you're there, even if you're not in the, in the best place, you can evaluate in the same merits. You still get the Harvard degree. Yeah. You still get access to the Harvard Alumni Network. Uh, and uh, I, I would say it's incumbent on you to make sure that you stand out. I, I don't think that it has anything to do with your connections or your network. Once you're in, you're in. And you're going to get to talk to the principals. Now, you, can, you should look at the class size. You know, is there one person running an incubator and there's 40 companies? Or is there like a good group of mentors and advisors and helpers? And you know, is there one of them assigned to every two or three companies? It makes yeah. a big difference. Is, it, is um, your question about whether I should apply to an accelerator or not, or which accelerator or incubator to apply to? Uh, no, no, that was a question more along the lines for the A. The yeah. A grade, uh, not yeah. not the B grade. I, I would I would agree with Naval. In fact, I've I've heard people brag about like getting into a YC interview and not getting accepted. They <laughs> actually think that that's a filter. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I would say go ahead and apply to the accelerators, and then once you get in, then you can go to them and express your concerns. Say, what are you gonna, you know, yeah. hey, I'd like to check some references on you. Let's talk about your last class and if they're happy or not. Yeah. Keep in mind, the accelerator's business model is to get equity out of you, and they make money for that. Um, so accelerators view getting a good entrepreneur in as a win. Um, so once you have been accepted, you as a good entrepreneur have the right to turn around and be choosy and ask hard questions because you're paying in equity. You're paying in future sweat. Thanks. Cool. Hey guys, again. Um, Dave, so we actually met last year. Uh, 500 Startups was going to be a part of the, uh, the investments. But anyhow, what, did um, I bail out? No, we actually <laughs> denied you guys. No. Oh, fuck. Oh, get off the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, 
But anyhow, I'd love to talk to you about what we're doing today. So uh, my, my question is about valuations in certain stages. So the early stage, uh, Series A stage, you know, what, how do you, how do you, you know, is valuation based upon traction, user growth, um, you know, how do you guys look at uh, valuing? Va valuation is a black art and a dark science. And uh, yeah. the way it generally works is, first, you're fundable or not fundable. If you make it to fundable, then you will probably get funded at whatever the average is for companies getting funded that day for roughly similar companies. Um, so it's more market-based than based on you. And then within that basis, if you end up heavily oversubscribed or lots of people want to stampede in, you can incrementally raise the valuation as you are closing. So it is much more based on the market and around your startup and then the supply and demand for your deal because there's no objective way to value these things. There's no DCF calculation I can do or spreadsheet I can run. Um, we will be releasing a data set within the next few months at AngelList of about 2,000 companies. Um, and we'll break down the valuation for you, all anonymized, of course, and scrub. Uh, but you'll be able to say, OK, if I'm an MIT founder uh, and I've got, you know, and I'm a 500 startups grad and I'm raising, you know, last three months and it's a SaaS company, what's my valuation? We'll give you the averages. So at least you'll have a sense of what the market pricing is. Um, there are actually already some sites on the web. I think Startup Data Trends uses our database and they publish some average valuation data. Um, but generally, there's, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. It is based very much on the market. Uh, the best way to approximate the market right now is just to survey uh, five or ten entrepreneur friends, maybe fellow alumni from uh, your incubator, um, and see what they're hearing and seeing. You can always just drop me an email. I'll make up a number for you, but it'll be a total guess. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would definitely agree that it's much more based on market demand. So there are, there are some comparables based on where you're at and what stage. And then within those comparables, uh, if you have a lot of investors uh, pursuing you, it'll be higher versus not. You can also do like enterprise sales people do it. Like uh, one of the best enterprise sales guys I've ever met told me how he used to sell software. And this is back in the day when people used to buy hosted software, right? <laughs> uh, or like on-premises licensed software. And he'd go and he'd say, oh yeah, that's uh, $2,000. And if they didn't blink, he'd say, per, per person. Year. Per if they didn't blink, he'd say <laughs> per month. And if they didn't blink, he'd say plus maintenance. <laughs> right? So you just got to keep ratcheting it up. Uh, the equivalent in fundraising is a little different, which is you can go to the first investor and you can tell them what you want. And if they don't blink, then you go to the second one and raise the price slightly. If they don't blink, you go to the third one and raise the price slightly. But it's a very, very hard game to play. I, I don't suggest neophytes play that game. My, my only yeah. caution on this is, uh, and obviously I'm biased and I'm a really stage investor, uh, I would not be trying to jack your first investor at the maximum market price. Yeah. I think you would probably want to have at least your first possibly your second set of investors bought in and give them a little bit of a you know, cushion based on what your current market price is. Uh, yeah. If the current market price is five and you price it five and then the market goes down to three, uh, your investors will be much less motivated. Yeah, one of the things to keep in mind is that the most of the dilution comes in the venture round. Those venture rounds can be 30%, 50% diluted, whereas angel rounds are 10%, 20% diluted. Th and the incubator those rounds you have to optimize a few percent. for price. Yeah. So what you're really optimizing for is the venture round, not for the angel or the incubator round. So if you can get the incubators and the angels on your side, where they're locked in at a good valuation, and then they don't wanna, they're not going to invest again a lot more at the higher valuation. They have an incentive, just like you, to crank up the next round valuation. So they can give you good feedback and data and help you ramp it up. So your sensitivity to valuation should be a function of how much equity you're giving up. Yeah. Uh, I think we're probably going to get yanked here, so maybe one or two more questions uh, if, you're, if you're... Excellent. Thank you. That was actually my question, um, huh. so I have to come up with another one. <laughs> That's a, you don't have to. I mean, there's someone behind no, you. No, no, so. no, I will. Oh, oh, well, you, can, you can quit now. We can all start drinking. Right. <laughs> Uh, what kind of relationship? Oh, but that's a good piece of advice, by the way. It's much easier to close a deal with an investor over a drink than it is otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the things we pioneered at Angel this early on that I'm proud of is kind of this, the, the social pressure confirmation, yes. which is you can confirm an investor in, on, on your Angelist profile in front of a community of their peers. So if someone commits to invest in the old days, you'd have to go home, do the paperwork, pull the rest around together, and then three weeks later when you reach for the money, they're gone. Um, but this way, you can just add them to your Angelist profile. They get a confirmation email. They confirm. They're mentally bought in. They're committed. So take advantage of that. <laughs> Sorry. No, no problem. Question. Please. Uh, so tagging on the gentleman's last question, what kind of things when you get uh, an investor early on, let's say you need more money because you need to take this product that you built to the market, 
but maybe you don't have enough money to do analytics and look at all those type of things. You know, what kind of things are you looking for in a company uh, early on in terms of milestones other than just a product and traction like you mentioned before? Yeah. What kind of things are you looking at also? Part B is what kind of relationship do you want with that, that yeah. company? Do you want to know early on of what's going on? Or do you want them to come to you and say, hey, we're projected you know, negative 10 and we need money to get the product to market? So to answer those. If you would. Yeah, just to be clear, is the question what updates should you, give, should you give an investor before they invest, or is it how do you what else can you get them to invest in the basis of other than product or traction? Well, if you if you need more money, and what kind of milestones are you going to look to to basically either increase your valuation with that current investor, uh, where you have an argument as a company to say, hey, we're actually worth more. Yeah. Um, and then also that being said. Um, at the end of the day, it's mostly going to be supply and demand, opportunity cost. If you have just one investor that you're negotiating with, you have no leverage. Okay. Uh, so you need to have a couple of people in the mix. Okay. And then my I, would, part, I would say product please. market revenue profitability. So like product, is it done or not? Is right. it, you know, market, is it being used by people? How many people? And then revenue, are they paying for it? How much revenue? And you know, the, the, closer the t- thing on revenue. The toughest and the most important one that we haven't touched on and that... Uh, Every venture capitalist will tell you at the end of the day they invest because of the team. The yeah, team right. is the most important thing. And it is the hardest to measure, it's the hardest to proxy, and everybody thinks they're great. So it's very hard to, and, and nobody gives negative feedback. No venture capitalist is ever going to tell you, I'm passing because I don't like you and your team. They'll never yeah. say that, right? But it is actually the single most common reason you get passed over. And, and um, some every, every rule I threw, I, I threw out is junk if the great team shows up. A great team can still walk in, no product, no revenue, no traction, get up on a whiteboard and still raise it's money. 10 million, yeah. So it, it, a lot of it boils down to the team. And so your highest order bit should be recruiting the impossible team. Okay. Yeah, and if you have uh, college or company brand references on those people, make sure they're listing them in their profiles and on other related profiles. Yeah. Like or LinkedIn. achievement preferences, like you know, yeah. won some gold medal coding competition. <laughs> Solved an original <laughs> math theorem, right? That I actually look for those personally. I like the physicists and the mathematicians and the athletes who have shown they can win at something else that is hard. Uh, and I'll often use that as a proxy for the inner drive of the person and the accomplishment level that they're capable of. Gotcha. Cool. And uh, just that last quick question is, uh, uh, what kind, do you want to know early on of what's going on with the progress or do you want the company to basically, because I get the impression that small companies are supposed to have this impression in front of the investors. They know what's going on. We're doing well, all that kind of stuff. But you as investors in small, you know, small startups, do you like to know early on of what the truth is or do you want to kind of just be delivered, yeah. hey, we're negative 10? In- investors have an incredibly good bullshit sensor because they get pitched all day long. <laughs> so they just get really good at it. Um, I will bet you that I can probably uh, you know, figure out if you're bullshitting me faster than you can figure out if you're bullshitting yourself. And that's just because I've been pitched so much. You just get, you just see all the different ways in which, it, like, oh, he's looking at his shoes when he says that. Oh, he's hedging that comment. Or, oh, he said that number before and then that number again they didn't quite match up, right? Don't try and bullshit anyone. Especially the smarter the investor, the better they are, the more honest and straightforward you should be. They actually appreciate that. Yeah, depends on the investor, but I prefer bad news as soon as possible. Good news is great too, but uh, less frequent. Cool. Thank you both. Yeah, in that sense, I think pitch training has been way overdone. Like all the people who get up there in the stilted voice and pitch everything exactly the yeah. same way, I think it costs you credibility now because investors have seen too many of those canned pitches. They'd rather see a genuine conversation. If you have, if you have great metrics, show them. Yeah. If you don't, work on your pitch. <laughs> uh, thanks. I think we're way over, but uh, think, thanks for... Uh, uh, having us up here, and thanks, Naval. Thank you, Thank you Dave everyone. and Naval. Let's hear it for them. Hold on. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for dropping some awesome advice. Thank you, sir. That was great. Thanks for building Twilio. Let's hear it for Dave and Naval.